Willkommen zurück beim Tag der Konrad Adenauer. Welcome back to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Open Day. The topic of participation and representation is close to the CASA's heart. He is Alexander Everend. He let see. He deals with democracy, right, and party at the foundation. Alexander, I have the impression that the political interest in society did increase in the last years. Especially my generation shows that, especially on social media there are controversial debates cropping up at the same time everybody sort of lives in their own bubble and sometimes despite all controversy this results in polarization what is your impression yeah i totally agree we observe polarization in europe we observe polarization beyond this Con communication becomes rougher there are parts in society that deem compromise as a weakness. For instance, when it comes to climate, there are different positions that seem to be irreconcilable. Of course, we have a different view because compromises, yeah, they can be cumbersome, but this is what democracy is all about. Democracy is about developing a solution where ideally all or as many as possible can identify. And of course, we look also at compromises in other countries. How are decisions made in other countries? How other countries do it might be interesting also for us. We might translate these things into our own context. And of course, we also look at political discussions in other countries. And I'm very pleased that we in the next hour can focus on citizens' participation in Germany, in Europe, and also in Latin America. Thank you very much for your impression. The current format on participation, we typed video recorded together with our offices in Chile and Colombia. So let us also go to the democracy lab in Greifswald. And there's also something happening organized by the CAS. We have a polling tool with six questions, and you can vote on these in the next 90 minutes. Together with Alexander, we will talk about the results later, but we will now talk, start with a contribution of the International Office of CAS in Chile. Santiago, Chile. Santiago. Chile. Here is the first municipal action plan of an open government in all of Chile was realized. It was implemented by the Tribu Foundation with the support of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and ILPIS from CIPAL, which followed the process as observers. This community action day was attended by representatives of authorities, local residents and employees of municipal administrations. It was a collaborative creative process that took almost a full year to gather the most important interests and needs of the community. Since 2018, with the support of the Adenauer Foundation, we have worked to create the first municipal open government plan in Chile for Renca. This has been a great experience and there has been great participation on part of our community. We believe that the answer to the existing mistrust of institutions must be more communication, more transparency, more accountability to a formally organized community. Now, what does open government mean? Open government is a renewed form of governance. The main pillars are transparency, citizens' participation, accountability, and the use of technologies and innovation that strengthen implementation. Through this, open government seeks to strengthen the role of citizenship through participation in action plans. Citizens are involved in decisions about public spaces through participation in multi-stakeholder dialogues and regular forums. In doing so, the community is involved in the entire process. A community action plan allows for incremental progress towards open government, while adhering to the standards established for open government. One of the obvious results is citizens who feel they are making a difference for their community. As a result of this process, five commitments were developed. Three were put forward by citizens, two by municipal representatives. The Konrad Adenauer Foundation has been promoting democracy based on the rule of law for more than 50 years. The concept of open government allows for an open and participatory dialogue between community, politics, 
and citizens. The citizens come together more often and can also open up for more for their problems because otherwise they usually stay at home. Through these workshops, people open up more, they exchange ideas, they find each other more. Everyone else is at home and has no idea how everything works or how the mayor manages things. So you get to know how he does his job. If there was no point, I would say this without hesitation. This is the first time that our community has come together. This is really important progress for us, the neighbors, because we see change that we, the residents of Renka, have been asking for many years. So welcome to the studio. After talking about innovation and security already, we now, dear audience, would like to shed some light on another important topic, an issue that the Adenauer Foundation is focusing on. It is about representation and participation. We put up a bouquet of questions. We will again go abroad, again to Latin America, then we will look at Germany, the Adenauer Foundation's activities in Germany. And for us as a European foundation, the European factor should not be forgotten. The Adenauer Foundation is present in more than 100 countries, amongst others in the fascinating countries of Chile and Colombia countries that we are focusing on now and here. And the activities of the CAS in Chile have just been shown in the video. We will also talk about the country again later. Now let's go to Colombia. And I'm sure that you have heard about the social protests in Colombia. I'm sure that, that you have read about them. And they clearly show how much tension there is in politics and in society in this country. All the more, it is important to stage a dialogue with society. And this is exactly what the Konrad Adenauer Foundation has been doing for more than 55 years. The foundation has been contributing to strengthening democracy there and to fostering the rule of law in Colombia. Our colleagues in the Bogota office will now give you an insight into the activities of the foundation in the country. It is about the 30th anniversary of the Colombian constitution and innovative forms of citizen participation. It's about digitization, potential and opportunities of advancing digitization. But it's also gonna be about the question of how can we make sure that as many citizens as possible can participate in the digital society. They will present a toolbox that was developed with the support of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and that communicates the idea of open government. In other words, to contribute to transparent citizen related and innovative decision making processes. This year marks the 30th anniversary of Colombia's constitution. That's 30 years of democracy that, in addition to being representative, also want to be participatory. It's a young constitution that citizens still need to internalize and better understand, especially the participatory mechanisms. When Colombia's political constitution was created in 1991, the intention was to give stability to democracy and create opportunities for citizen participation and political involvement. This participation is more than just exercising the right to vote. In our country, there is a large constitutional framework for the participation of Colombian citizens. For example, there is the right of, of petition, legal supervision, appeal, and referendum. However, the approach to public life does not depend only on the existence of these mechanisms. It also includes the culture and the direct participation of the people. And this is where the work of CAS comes in. In Colombia, we work together with organizations that contribute to the involvement of citizens, their connection with the public sector, and the strengthening of institutions and democracy. We develop different and highly innovative projects together with them. For example, together with Extituto, we are developing the Haga U Mega Hipe projects. These are tools for the implementation of open governments in local administrations, through which it is attempted to open the way for citizens to participate in decision-making processes. 
We also publish for civil society the Permanent Citizens Handbook. And through this collection of texts, we want organizations to increase their influence in the public sector. Together with the Election Observation Mission, we are developing a digital platform for electing authority representatives in processes of everyday democracy that is secure and can be integrated into local elections. Together with Columbia Leader, we are implementing the program for the technical strengthening of communities throughout Colombia. We aim to develop capacity in institutions for development, public management, outreach to society, and transparency. On the other hand, the situation of social leaders in Colombia is critical. This is why, together with Movilizatorio, we have developed a tweet for all social leaders in Colombia to help them create new collective forms and new forms of participation participation. Certain regions, due to their specificities, need special attention when it comes to strengthening the work of social leaders. This is the case for Colombia's Pacific Coast and the Department of Choco, where we are working with the Pacifista organization to run a strategic communication course for 15 women leaders from across the department. Since 2015, the immigration of citizens from Venezuela has been a crucial issue for our country. That is why we are carrying out a project together with Derecho Noverencia to improve the participation of these people, especially immigrant women, through training and promotion. Despite the progress made in citizen participation, Colombia still faces a number of challenges. How to bring connectivity and the digital age together and offer more channels to citizens? Considering that 30% of Colombia's population lives in rural areas, it is important to give this population a greater voice and more participation. It is also necessary for national and local institutions to open their decision-making mechanisms to citizens, to all citizens. At the same time, it must also be recognized that citizen participation is a two-way dialogue. On the one hand, citizens need to get to know the framework in which they can exert influence, on the other hand, the state and its institutions must set their channels to receive the message. In conclusion, it is essential that both the state and citizens comply with the rules of the game that guarantee transparency in democratic decision-making processes. Today, we are celebrating the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Open Day, and we are happy to present to them our work for democracy in Colombia. Thank you very much for this exciting contribution. We have seen how important it is to have analog and digital citizen representation and participation forms. And this video also emphasized how crucial and important the regions and municipalities are, because the situation there shows that this is where societal life is taking place. Today, where we want to focus on citizen participation, we also want to shed light at the situation in Germany and take a look at what Adenauer Foundation does here in Germany. One example is the Political Education Forum of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and the Democracy Lab in Greifswald, an impressive university city. The University of Greifswald, by the way, is the second oldest university in the Baltic region. The oldest university in the Baltic region, by the way, is also in Germany. That is the University of Rostock. The Democracy Lab wants to make democracy future-proof, wants to test different forms of citizen participation, wants to listen to people, wants to find out how people mask challenges and make change happen together. And all of that is happening in the Democracy Lab in Greifswald. And my colleague, Ms. Fennert, is going to present the Democracy Lab in detail. My name is Dana Fennert. I'm a speaker for the project Common democracy or jointly shaped democracy at the Adenauer Foundation. Welcome in our democracy lab here in the Steinbecker Straße in Greifswald. We have established this democracy lab in order to get talking to you and together with you to shape our democracy. About one year ago, we opened the democracy lab and with the CAS bus, we went to northern Brandenburg, to Greifswald, to the island of Usedom to Henningsdorf in Sidowitz, Pasewalk. We also went to the island of Rügen to Putbus and Binz. 
democracy is, of course, an important basis, especially in Germany, to especially for our history, regarding our history. And we have to learn to be democratic with one another and discuss. And even if 20% of people would vote for right-wing parties, there would still be 80% who don't. I don't think that democracy is actually in danger, but I do think it's facing great challenges. We are now trying to fill the common rooms with life, with cultural life as well. We talk about how we can shape democracy together. I think it's a good format that will continue to develop that the political foundations and their mandate can actually reach a broader public. That as a Christian, I will strive for letting other people know that we all have a creator, that we belong to him, and that that can bring a lot of peace to our lives. Make use of your democratic right to vote and ensure that democracy will continue and survive. It is about strengthening the political center in our country to foster political will or shaping political will in all groups in the population. And in times of corona, to really look at political tendencies or streams, look at populism that is growing. We need to take a closer look and to make it very clear that we have arguments why populism is nothing we want in the east of our country. We have organized a youth policy day. Uh, we have um, had days with contemporary witnesses in our lab. Last year, we had the 70-year anniversary of our constitution, and we took this as a starting point to get talking to young people about our basic rights. We used the method of poetry slam to let the young people to tell us about their own thoughts. Every person has a right to freedom. Every person has a right to protection. Every person has their dignity, and that is good. Maybe you have to look for freedom of opinion. And can I ask you, before you hurt someone again, why don't you check what you say next time? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Poetry Slam here in the old brewery in Angamunde. The title was You and Your Basic Rights. We talked about basic rights with people. We wanted to know how people thought about their basic rights, like freedom of opinion, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, the work to write. And I thought it was a good idea of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation to offer this project. That was a one-time event and it was a good, it really complemented the work that we do here with children and young people. And generally, I think that should be the model that we follow in children and youth work, especially as a professional poetry slammer. I think freedom of expression, freedom of opinion is very important. As a poetry slammer, it's uh, basically the freedom of um, personal development. And this format can only work if there are weird and different people coming on the stage who are free to say what they want to say. But the step before the freedom of opinion is the personal development, the freedom to personal development. And you may say, I'm crazy. Yes, I may be crazy, but I'm free.
Vielen herzlichen Dank für dieses. Thank you so much for this exciting contribution. And I'm now very happy that we can go live to the Democracy Lab in Greifswald, where we will talk to the head of the Democracy Lab. And uh, Dr. Bremer, who is the head of the Political Education Forum Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, I'm sorry. And we will also talk to the head of the Chile Office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Beribis. We are live at the Democracy Lab in Greifswald. We have various events here on the topic of participation in our society. I am Silke Bremer. We now have a brief round of discussion talking about citizen participation, participation in democracy. And I have two very exciting partners. One is Dr. Letrari. She is head of the Voluntary Foundation Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. And from Chile, we have Andreas Klein, who's head of the Chile office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Mrs. Letrari, the heart of democracy beats in parliaments. And it is the political parties, first and foremost, that have the mandate to shape politics and society. In the new federal lender, the organizational degree of the parties is much lower than in the old federal state, even 30 years after the reunification. That is a trend we can see. Why would you say that is? Dr. Brima, first of all, thank you very much to be here in Greifswald today at the Democracy Lab. I would like to answer your question as follows. The transformation space of Eastern Germany has a very complex history, not just over the past 30 years, but also in the years before 1989. We have, there are two developments that complement one another. We know this development from all of Germany that people tend to decide to get active rather ad hoc, rather than becoming a member of a party or an organization. They spontaneously decide to participate somewhere and this is this trend can be seen even more in eastern germany and secondly we have a cultural space here where we have very differentiated experience or people have had a very differentiated experience uh, with living with uh, under a certain party the, a party that um, establishes framework conditions for your life all the way down to your personal life. Decisions that were taken that affected choice of career, choice of place of residence, um, families. So even before 1989, people didn't really have great experiences with one party and after 1989 this space of transformation has witnessed a very successful political and um, economic development the cultural union mainly saw a, a one directional um, movement of culture but it meant that a lot of people didn't really feel that. And there was a transfer mainly from the West to the East only. So these would be maybe my reasons why people are hesitant to join political parties or organizations. You are the head of the Voluntary Office Foundation in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. So you have a mandate here. You probably have good contacts or possibilities to react to this situation. So as a foundation, how do you try to support developments? What kind of formats do you use? And 
you are rather new to your job. Maybe you have ideas for the future where we can be a bit less conventional and use new methods to approach the topic. Indeed, I have taken up the job as head of the foundation in autumn last year. We have looked at processes in our foundation. We have thought about why, why do we actually exist? What's our purpose? And we realized we are a motor of democracy, but how do we do that? How do we deal with it? We have the opportunity to have voluntary initiatives in a very small format, initiatives in every village, in every country, and we can support them. And a lot of organizations actually take up our offer. And we hope to do something there before maybe right-wing tendencies occupy that space. Maybe tendencies that are less democratic. We also have the opportunity to support initiatives in providing legal counseling and starting this autumn we also have a program of organizational development because the teams that are looking at good ideas in mecklenburg vorpommern that maybe due to the pandemic they have to take the next step um, that means restructuring, reorganizing. We have different, seen different phenomena. We have teams or little associations that have, that have a very high average age. So we need the engagement of young people. We need to have cooperation in a federal state where people tend to live very far apart from one another. So I think um, the offer that we can make is something that these organizations should really take up. We have conducted a survey within those organizations and groups, and we have counseling units worth 3,000 euros that they can make use of, that we can provide legal advice, for example. I believe this is going to give some fresh impetus also to voluntary work. And this will enable us to live democracy. It doesn't always have the party landscape to get active with regard to democracy. You can also show engagement in your local sports club because you still contribute to shaping the society beyond your own little space. I think these are really good structures that were created in order to foster political participation. Let us now move to South America. Andreas, I am very pleased to see you here today. And I think you will confirm that no country is like the other. So democracy is different as well, participation as a basic principle is something that all democracies have in common or should have in common. I would like to know how Chile deals with this topic or how people in Chile talk about this topic. Are there people who are ready and willing to engage for democracy and society? Well, first of all, hello to Greifswald. We are in Chile in a situation which is kind of a historical, exciting crossroads. Since October 2019, we have seen social unrest because of extreme inequalities that we can see and find in many countries in South America, particularly also in Chile. And because of the social unrest that was partly violent, a constitutional process was launched Firstly, because of a political agreement between the government and the opposition. However, the citizens were asked to vote on whether they want a new constitution or not. So this referendum took place 
last year during the pandemic, and a lion's share of the population voted for a new constitution. So it was a direct mandate to policymakers to launch this constitutional process. And 14 days ago, there were elections for a constitutional assembly. So the citizens could exercise their right to vote freely. And the next two, nine to 12 months, a constitutional will now be developed by a constitutional assembly. And once this document has been finalized, this text will again be put up for vote to the citizens. And if two thirds of the population affirms and confirms this new constitutional text, the constitution will be adopted. The new thing about the Constitutional Assembly is that a lion's share of independent candidates, i.e. people who don't belong to any political party and have their first contact to politics or policymakers in general, have been elected and now bear responsibility in terms of drafting this constitutional text. And this, of course, shows that there is a huge loss of trust in traditional parties, but this also, positively speaking, shows that there is an increase in trust in citizens who made themselves available for this constitutional process. Okay, Andreas, thank you very much for that. Now, before you went to Chile, you were in charge of political education in the German city of Hamburg. And I would like to know from you how you compare these two countries with regards to political participation. So what are commonalities and what are differences? Well, the tradition is of course different in each and every country. I mean, Hamburg in Germany is kind of a role model or a pioneer when it comes to elements of direct democracy. They have referendums, they have seen referendums legally embedded since the 1990s. So this is the Hamburg tradition, but also at a district level, they have been very advanced. Chile is different. Chile could be compared with Eastern Europe and Eastern Germany. So the democracy, the democracy movement here emerged at the end of the 1980s, when big parts of the population when took to the streets against Pinochet's regime. And in Eastern Europe in 1989-90, we saw similar developments. The people were against the prolongation of dictatorship. At the time, it was a very difficult situation in Chile, of course. And the restoration of democracy in Chile was started in 1990. The first democratic government came into office. And ever since, we have seen stable democracy in Chile. It is a representative democracy with a strong president. But people demand more nowadays. So in the last 30 years, Chile has seen good developments, especially in the business sector. So we have developed a stable democracy here, or they also compared to the neighboring countries. But the constitution that is still in power stems from the time of military dictatorship. And for many people, overcoming this old constitution means or implies the beginning of a new era of an era which is even more democratic. And I'm sure that the new constitution will pick up elements that focus on more direct democracy. For instance, referendums that will be embedded in law. 
a legal means that we have seen in Hamburg, for instance, for many years. Pluralism is an essential feature of a democracy. Pluralism should go hand in hand and be connected to a culture of debate. In Germany, in the last years, we have observed, particularly on social media, that our culture of debates has become under pressure. Have you seen similar developments in Chile? So at the international office, is this a subject or an issue for you? So have you worked against such developments? Yes, absolutely. Of course, this is a challenge here as well. The culture of debate on social media has dramatically increased in the last years and the quality of debates has dramatically gone down in the last years. We see this on Twitter and other social media. So people from the other political camp are criticized, are verbally attacked, falsified and fake news are spread, conspiracy theories. This of course also happened before the pandemic. So they really fight each other verbally. And we as the Konrad Adenauer Foundation are trying to counteract this, to do something against it. For instance, in the area of fake news, we cooperate with a partner, with a small team that follows political debates and that becomes active if consciously or subconsciously false news is spread and distributed. And they sort of correct these fake news. They do fact checking and then they spread correct news through their channels. In Germany, like elsewhere on this planet, once negative or fake news is out there, it is very difficult to do something against it and to correct this. But of course, yes, we are trying to do this with our partners and through our channels. And these partners normally don't get other funding. They are only funded by us. These are normally NGOs, journalists that are in a difficult position anyway, economically speaking, and we try to support them in their activities and in their work. Yes, Ms. Letari, we or you are very active in the network Third Generation East. These are kids that grew up with transformation experience. They are said to be very flexible and they are said to be very good when it comes to dealing with change. These transition kids, these kids of the Generation East, are they actually able to take on significant positions? There's just one answer to this. Yes, yes, absolutely. Like we have just heard from Mr. Klein, the potential of the young generation is really huge and it is crucial, especially for countries where the generation of those who now grow into positions of responsibility. This is the case of these kids of the fall of the wall generation. They are now 30 to 40 years old. And they grew up with parents who had made the experience of an authoritarian regime. And you mentioned it earlier. This, of course, has implications on their self-image when it comes to participation, up to the question of whether they want to become a member of a party or not. And it is absolutely crucial for Eastern Germany, and I think this also applies to Chile, that this generation now assumes responsibility because these kids were lucky enough to grow up in a united Germany. So they were kids and young adults in a united Germany, but they also experienced what it means to grow up in an authoritarian regime because they were very young when the wall was still up. And now change is happening. Now positions are vacant for these people. So people who left their home in the 1990s are now willing to return to their home cities. And this, of course, will have a positive impact on our society as a whole. So it is 
crucial that they unpack their backpack here again in Eastern Germany. And this also will have an impact on the parents and the grandparents. So if they see that representation and leadership is assumed by the kids and by the grandchildren, they can then also trust the system more. So they will see that their kids and grandchildren can decide for and in the country that they liberated in 1989. Thank you very much. Participation is a very attractive topic for a specific generation. And now let us go to Andreas Klein again, who is in Chile. Participation is a very important topic for the Adenauer Foundation. So what do you do in Chile when it comes to the topic of participation? What role does participation play in Chile? Maybe you can briefly comment on the role of this subject in Chile. Yes, of course, participation as a whole is one of the key issues of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Chile. And as has already been mentioned, we here, of course, also focus on the young generation. It is not necessarily students, but it is young people. It is the young generation that grew up in Chile's democracy in the last 30 years. They have some experience with dictatorship when they were still young. And they have also gained experience in civil society. They have a totally different mindset. They have a totally different participatory thinking. And there we work together with young mayors and city councils and councillors who try to focus on open governance and include new elements of municipal politics and direct democracy at a municipal level. This is a very important project and it is also supported by the UN organization CEPAL and is, or has been very successful. Yeah, thank you so much to Ms. Letrari. Thank you, Andreas. And I think it has become clear in our very brief discussion that fostering participation is a key task for democratic, democratic societies. And how this has been done in Greifswald in the last years will now be discussed. Let me pass the mic to Dana Fennett, and she is now talking to an artist who in the last two years has been active in the context of this democracy project in Greifswald. So yes, the floor is yours, Ms. Fennett. Thank you to Zilke Bremer. We are in Greifswald in the Museum Harbor and Teresa Steigler, hello, hello. It is wonderful to be here with you. Teresa, you are an author and a slam poet, writer, and texter. So you studied literature science here in Greifswald. And in the context of different formats, we could cooperate with you. What motivated you to participate in this project? Good question. In January last year, we met, that was before Corona. And at the time, I noticed that I find politics interesting but I don't really want to become a policymaker. But uh, there are many political topics that I pick up in my activities. This is maybe why you also got to know me. And then when Corona started, I found it even more important to work for and with you and to design these projects together with you because the notion of democracy became even more significant in the course of the last year. Theresa, I mean, for instance, we worked on a poetry competition together or we announced it or we also in the context of our democracy bus tour we cooperated you were there and you presented the democracy melodies there what was a special experience in this context for you well the writing seminar unfortunately happened online but that was not a problem because the range the virtual range was much bigger and people from all over germany participated or could participate it that was very nice i mean this is the nice thing about the online format the range is much bigger 
But when it comes to the Democracy Bus Tour, yeah, that was also a very exciting project because we talked a lot with all kinds of different people who saw us somehow as policymakers and they sought dialogue and they sought a communication with us. There were people who discussed with us and sometimes we were just standing there for an hour. We were discussing Corona policies. And then in Rostock, I remember in a nice situation, there were young people approaching us and they were very skeptical. They didn't know what we were doing. And they said, uh, you just want to hear what you expect us to say. And this sort of launched a debate. And they then also participated in a very nice poem game and we talked about politics with them we talked about different parties and we asked them what they think about different developments and i found this very fruitful and then stralsund was another highlight i mean also in terms of traveling it was very nice to travel to another city so the democracy bus tour was really very nice you mentioned the poetry or the chain poem the poetry game. Maybe you can explain to us what this was. Yes, the chain poem. We had different sentences. The first one was, when I think of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, then I think of dot, dot, dot. And everybody had a chance to fill this in and to complete the sentence. And I just read the sentence and they completed the sentence. And I turned this into an advent calendar in December because I like the different voices. These were not my voices and texts. These were texts and statements of people, of ordinary citizens. I mean, that is citizen participation for me. Theresa, if you had an adv advice for us as a foundation, what could we achieve with our democracy bus tour? Could we reach young people with the poetry slam tool? Yes, we did reach young people, it happened. And yes, it worked. But there are many other formats that you can maybe try. Poetry slam is now also a tool that is used in textbooks. Things that end up in textbooks might be outdated also very quickly, but maybe do, you should do rap or graffiti workshops. That could also work. This is a type of art that has also become political. There are many graffiti artists here in Greifswald. I can recommend different activists, so do this. That's my advice. It's really good. Thank you, Theresa. And uh, let's go back to the studio in Berlin. Thank you to Greifswald to the north. We have now talked a lot about citizen participation in Chile, in Colombia, in Germany. And there is one more level that we haven't talked about that we need to talk about. That's the European level. For the Adenauer Foundation, Europe is not just a nice to have. It's a must have. And I'm now very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about Europe and citizen participation. I would like to welcome Mrs. Leikert. Mrs. Leikert isn't just a committed European. She has made her passion her job. She is the deputy chairwoman of the CDU CSU parliamentary group at the Bundestag and also spokesperson for human rights. Mrs. Leikert, you are on the road a lot in Germany, in your constituency, in Hanau, in Europe. What does Europe mean to you in the year 2021? Well, if you look around in the world, then Europe and the European Union is a bit of a political miracle. I think you can say that. If 27 states come together and give themselves common rules and standards, and if there were such a thing as an award for the most beautiful political idea, I think apart from democracy, it would be the European Union, or it would be one of the top awards that you could give. And more tangibly, Europe is a space of freedom individual freedom, traveling, working, studying. This is what you can do across borders in Europe. And as 
constituency MP and as a citizen, I think Europe is also a space of wealth and welfare. The companies in my constituency, also in Germany, they deliver more than 50% of their goods, not abroad, but into other countries of the European Union and thus safeguard our wealth so or our prosperity. So I think the idea is beautiful, but also the implementation of the EU concept is effective. And it is a, it is a space in which I love to live. We want to make use of the opportunity to talk about a process, a discussion process that started not so long ago, which is the Conference on the Future of Europe. What is this process about? What is this process of citizen participation? What we can see with the European Union is that it is more and more faced with questions that can only be solved by a large community. For example, climate, digitization, these don't make sense to be, it doesn't make sense to solve these problems at national level. We need a European internal market to position ourselves well internationally. And that means we have to include the citizens, integrate them, let them take part in a cross-border dialogue. And I went to the website established by the European Union. More than 15,000 citizens have already taken part. And I think this echo shows how much citizens like to participate, to have a say to think about the capability of functioning that the EU has. In the past, there have been other citizen participation processes or initiatives, discussion processes, reflection processes, in the scope of which questions were discussed, such as how can we make the EU more people oriented, more capable of functioning or acting? So what's new about this process? I think what's really convincing is that these digital platforms are used well. I'm really excited to see that so many people have already taken part. And it's so great if there are people from the Netherlands commenting on proposals from Spain, for example. So this goes all across Europe. It is really tangible and it's really easy. Everyone can join whatever event, an event that takes part in Italy, for example. You can take part. There will be four cross-border European dialogues in Dublin, in Maastricht, in Warsaw, and Florence. And the citizens will be able to participate in the plenary sessions where politicians will also be present. Since 2013, you have been an MP of the German Bundestag. Can you tell us what role do national parliaments such as the German Bundestag play in the European Union? Well, as national politicians, we are in close contact with our colleagues in Brussels. Admittedly, this is difficult called or different. You, you just said it. 2013, I joined the German Bundestag and I was one responsible for health um, topics. And we did go to Brussels there and, and talk to colleagues there. But that is an area that is very much organized nationally. The pandemic has shown us that we need to have more um, concerted efforts. And there are other areas that are already much more European, for example, agriculture, digital policies, e economic policies. They have traditionally seen a more closer contact, closer exchange with Brussels, for example, or they might even come from Brussels. And therefore, it is necessary for us also in our national interest to be in close contact and exchange. And then when it comes to money, of course, we are also taking part as the German Bundestag. We discussed, for example, the recovery fund recently. 
how is that going to be designed, which money is going to, to be spent where. It's important to us that the money will be spent for future oriented topics, hydrogen projects, for example. So we are very actively participating in the discussion there, but also when it comes to topics such as taking taking on new member states. We had huge discussions in the recent years about, about North Macedonia, Albania, and the CDU-CSU parliamentary group um, made a contribution there together with its coalition partner, phrased preconditions for um, membership talks. We failed because of Bulgaria at that point in time but these are processes where the german bundestag really has a say and this is a bit different compared to as to the assemblée nationale in france where things are much more limited but we do actually have a very close exchange as european politicians with our colleagues in brussels it's a bit as if here in my constituency, I talk to the members of the regional parliaments or communal, uh, at communal level. So this is a bit of a federal nature. The exchange is, is very intense. Thank you very much, Mrs. Likert. The Conference on the Future of Europe consists of various modules. You already mentioned the digital platform, but there are also European citizen forums that are part of the conference, and they are chosen uh, randomly. It means not everyone can take part, but rather uh, participants are chosen randomly. Can you imagine that such randomly chosen citizen participation projects could become a fixed part of the political landscape in Germany or in Europe? I think it's a really good process that the European Union launched to not just include the institutional actors or the representatives from the national parliaments, but also the citizens directly through forums such as the ones you mentioned. The citizens in those forums, the citizens have a very different opportunity to voice their opinions or perspectives and, and to become active. At the end of the day, the results from such forums will be a blueprint or a template for institutions with elected candidates. They will discuss those templates and then come to final conclusions. So I do think that this, these processes of citizen forums, in addition to the Conference on the Future of Europe, are a very success, successful mix. The Conference on the Future of Europe also has a self-expectation or has set itself an objective, namely to reach out to all people, to everyone, uh, to all different groups in society. So how can we make sure that we reach those who feel left out, who have turned away, or maybe even those who have left the political and the democratic discourse? What I think is good is that the Commission has uh, information published in all your EU languages on its website so that people can voice their opinion in their own language. That's very important, so it's not exclusive. If it were only in English or French, then people wouldn't be able to or possibly wouldn't be able to participate in the exchange. On top, at national level and at regional and local level, there are respective conferences, and I can only encourage all my colleagues to set up such dialogue formats. I think this is the task of the politicians who um, take up the challenge in Bruchkübel, where I live, or in Hanau, which is my constituency, to really establish such formats. 
there is another self-expectation of the board of the conference, and that is to bring together different ideas about the future. And I'm wondering, isn't that a Herculean talk for proponents of the European federalism? They, they see the f conference as the next step towards a European state. National conservatives want a union of national states. But how can we make sure that the future on the con uh, the conference on the future of Europe uh, will place unifying factors above the di divisive? Well, that is a very exciting um, question. Also, as someone who studied politics, and I don't know how many seminars I took where I discussed exactly that question with lots of different people. This question: federal state, yes, no. That is a topic that is and will be a question for the future. And it is a question that we can, in theory, answer or solve. We discussed this from a German perspective against the backdrop of the German federal system, which is not a standard uh, system that we see in many other member states or also the United States of America that hasn't, however, uh, come about from naturally grown states. But the European Union is unique. It's a system so generous, as somebody once described it. And proceeding on that assumption, I think it's much more exciting to look at the practical question rather than the theoretical. What do we need today to make the European Union fit and ready for the future. As a citizen and other, as a mother, my idea is I need to make sure that the European Union is and remains a space worth living in. And the question is, how can we safeguard this European way of life and maybe even establish it as a standard against a rising China? And that should be our claim. And I think the the early momentum that Emmanuel Macron once described as we can only maintain our sovereignty by giving up sovereignty. So it's a higher form of there should be a higher form of sovereignty at European level that will one day protect us. And I think that's the question that should guide us. So what are the areas where we need to cooperate more closely in order to survive? I think that is the question that's a lot more interesting and that I think brings us together. And therefore, it's important to focus on the unifying factors and less uh, get lost in theoretical questions that would divide us. That should not be the result of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Is this a question that should be handled with kid gloves, do you think? The question of sovereignty? Yes, I think the way Emmanuel Macron described it is right. We can only get to a higher level of sovereignty if we ask ourselves the question, how can we equip the European level in a way that we can survive globally? And we won't survive if we try to have national roles of the game. We need a digital internal market, for example. We won't save world climate if in Bruchkübel Hanau or Germany alone we try to set climate targets. We can't manage to have Europe-wide targets at the moment, but it's important to have a standard. And we, it's important to have the European states agree on a more ambitious climate policy. And we did, and then the Chinese did as well. So it's so important to see Europe taking a leading position. And we can only do this if we are able to agree on a common policy. And with regard to the capability to act of the European Union, and again, that is the basic, that's the precondition for the Conference on the Future of Europe. That's the only guiding principle beyond ideological ideas on the one side or the other that aren't of great interest. They may be 
they just create positions that make us all go in the same direction. But if we are able to answer this question really well, how can we safeguard that the EU remains capable to act? And to what extent can we actually increase or um, extend this capability? When we look towards Syria, when we look towards foreign and security policy, we could cooperate more. And we can see once we're successful, when it comes to Belarus, for example, once we're successful, we are good. Once all 27 member states work together, then we can reach um, targets. That's the blueprint that we need to use to make the European Union fit for the future. The, my commission will be a geopolitical commission. These are the words of Mrs. von der Leyen, commission president. That's what she said when she started her job. What do those words mean in a time where Russia or in China, you mentioned China, challenge the EU? What does it mean for the European Union in a, to be geopolitical? Well, I have to say that the term geopolitics, well, I thought that this would be a term that fits to the 19th and beginning of the 20th century's contexts. It's coming up again, not because we wished for it. Many of us would have preferred to focus much more at a global level when it comes to managing global issues in the WHO. But we have reached a point where we have noticed that geopolitical challenges are increasing. And to master these challenges, we need a geopolitical commission. This is right, what Ms. von der Leyen said. Jean-Claude Juncker talked about a political commission beforehand. So in other words, the European Union has to master challenges in an environment which is no longer easy to tackle and handle. So you can no longer say, let us just focus on the single market. And even that is a big challenge. So we need to make sure that we compete internationally and we have to make sure that we are able to act. I can just re-emphasize how important it is that in the area of foreign and security policies, we may make progress soon. Our defense minister has highlighted again and again how important the European army is. This has been also re-emphasized by Ms. von der Leyen, but we need the will of the respective European states. So voting modalities when it comes to foreign and security policies, majority votings, for instance, I mean, these are very important aspects and approaches. There have been lengthy discussions, but now it's time to walk the talk. The Conference on the Future of Europe can provide the respective solutions for this. The Conference on the Future of Europe is a citizen-focused process, and it's often said that it is open in terms of its outcomes. And many people have the question, what will happen with the outcomes in the end? Maybe you can comment on this briefly. Yes. So I think that at the end of the conference on the future of Europe, we will see a comprehensive report on the 10 different topics, on what was discussed in the different forums, in other words. So where does the European Union require more competencies in order to make sure that it is able to act. And in spring 2022, this is going to happen. Yeah, and based on these outcomes, specific conclusions have to be drawn. And this then is the task of the institutions. They have to make sure that the respective drafts will be developed. Thank you, Ms. Leikert, for this interesting conversation. Thank you very much for taking the time. and. Hello to Hano. Thank you very much, Mr. Berbis, and thank you to the CAS. Have a nice remaining conference. Thank you. Yeah, and welcome back to our live 
stream. Thank you very much for voting. Together with Alexander, we are now going to show you the poll results and we are going to start with the first question. How should citizen participation look like in 2050? The result is very clear. 92% said we need a mix of analog and digital forms of citizen participation. Alexander, how would you interpret this result? Well, it's an exciting result. The future is also digital. Digitization is a rapidly increasing process that can no longer be stopped. It's a huge challenge and it is important to take the entire society on board, leave no one behind, participate offline and online. Our society, because of the pandemic, has undergone a digitization thrust. What we have observed is that they often try to transfer analog forms of, of citizen participation into digital formats. And this is going to change in the future. So in the next years and decades, I think we have will have to embark upon new paths. Another comment on digitization. We talked about open government today and the open government partnership has made a significant contribution. This is an international initiative to foster more transparency and participation in the area of governance. 78 states are now participating in this initiative and the Adenauer Foundation supports the open government partnership and also accompanies the German government's activities, especially in the area of open data. Interesting insights, thank you. Volunteering is a form of participation, very important to the CAS. So all scholars of the Adenauer Foundation also work as volunteers and are active in different areas. Another focal point of the CAS is art. There is, for instance, also a scholarship for artists. In our poll on art and artists, we also asked about volunteering and we also asked about citizen participation. And this is a question for you, Alexander. What do you think? Can art also be a form of citizen participation? Oh, yes, absolutely. We have also seen it here in Greifswald. Remember the conversation with a poetry slammer. So artists pick up societal issues potentially also issues below the political radar. They point out issues and problems. They have developed a sense for societal developments and changes. Sometimes they can even act preemptively. In situation of crises, we often see that artists use art in order to demonstrate and express political expressions. So art as a means of expressing one's opinion if political framework conditions are, for instance, limited. The Adenauer Foundation fosters artists also. Maybe a brief comment on citizen participation in general. This is absolutely necessary for a democracy because citizen participation is able to overcome gaps in societies, also internationally. Think of the city partnerships between regions and countries where policymakers are speechless, citizen participation kicks in and makes a very significant contribution. Yes, and there was a third important aspect. We just talked about the Conference on the Future of Europe. The clear tendency of our audience is, this sounds super exciting, but now I'm asking myself, where would you start with citizen participation at local level, at national level, or at a European level? I think all levels that you have just mentioned are crucial. We have seen during European elections in 2019 that so many part people participated. More people participated in those elections than ever, 200 million citizens. And the Conference on the Future of Europe is a chance to participate in political discussions, is a chance to use momentum, to get to know other people's positions, but also to market your own positions. It's about the future. It's not about finding responses to questions of the past. It is really about future visions. So please participate. Please raise your voice. Participate in this process. It would 
make us very happy. Thank you very much for your insights, Alexander. And this is the end of our participation unit. After a break, we will continue with the evening program with Professor Lomet Lamet and Armin Laschet. I will see you again at 7 p.m. German time. <laughs>